All right. On my way here, I had a dry throat, so I'm going to be picking this up now and then during the talk. Um, yeah, 49ers are in the Super Bowl. <laughs> When's the last time they were there? 2013? 2013. 2013. Yeah, they didn't win because of one play. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, so anyway, so we're, we've been talking about wisdom, and the, the, the verses that I have are very few. It's only five verses. So it's kind of hard to add anything to what, um, um, what he said last week in the video. But thinking about wisdom, you don't hear that word too often. You never hear about people talking about um, guys being wise. And do you ever hear that? You, we talk about how brilliant people are, how smart people are, how talent they might be, or even how athletic, you know, like the 49ers. <laughs> but the last time, when was the last time you ever heard somebody say, oh, that, that person's pretty wise? We use terms like wise guy or wise cracks, but that's not a very positive thing about using the word wise. Anybody hear of uh, the book Knowing God? J.R. Packer wrote that book back in the 70s. So when I was just starting out as a Christian, that was a really um, good book to, to read about how to, to get to know God, not knowing about God, but knowing God personally. Well, anyway, in that book, he gave two illustrations showing the wrong way of thinking about wisdom and the true experience of God's wisdom. The first illustration is, is one of a British railroad station because he was British, so that's where he's coming from. British Railway. He says, if you stand at the end of a platform, you can see the constant movement of trains going in and out. But you only can see just a minute detail of the overall plan of what's going on on that station because you don't see what's the background and you don't know why that train's sitting there, why that train's moving, why that train is going backwards, and why that train is just, you know, letting passengers on or letting passengers off. However, you go into a control room, you're going to see a long wall with a detailed diagram of all the tracks around the station with little lights blinking, indicating where the trains are. In a glance, you can see the whole entire station through the eyes of those in the control room. You see why one engine is uh, signaled to a halt, stop, and why another one's being diverted, and why another one sits at a stop. Okay? The reasoning of all the movements will, will be really plain to you when you look at that control uh, diagram with all the glowing lights. And then Dr. Packer says, here's the quote from this book, now the mistake that is commonly made is to suppose that this is an illustration of what God does when he bestows wisdom. To suppose, in other words, that the gift of wisdom consists, of, consists in a deepened insight into the meaning and purpose of events going on and around us. An ability to see why God has done what he has done in a particular case and what he is going to do next. So people would think that that's what wisdom is. It imagines that if they walk close enough to God, if they're, they're, they could be in God's control room. They'll understand everything that happens. These people always try to analyze the events of life, why things are happening the way they do, uh, why things happen or not happen, whether specific happenings are signs to stop, park on the side, or to go ahead. But when they are confused, like, why is this happening? Why can't I understand it? They assume that they have a spiritual problem, that they're not close to God to understand why. But Dr. Packer says, instead, the experience of God's wisdom is like learning to drive a car. When driving, it is important to make the right responses to constantly changing environments, different scenarios, to make a good judgment regarding speed, distance, and braking. If you're going to drive well, you don't need to know, like, why did the highway engineers design this S-curve here? Or what's the philosophy? Why do we have red light, yellow light, green light? Or why is that person accelerating and then have his foot on his brake at the same time? Rather, Dr. Packer says, you simply try to see and do the right thing in the actual situation that presents itself. The effect of divine wisdom is to enable you and me to do just that in the actual situations of life. See, in order to drive well, you need to keep your eyes wide open, see what's in front of you, 
and use your head. So to live wisely, you must be clear-eyed about people and life, seeing life as it is, and then responding with a mind dependent on the wisdom of God. Being wise does not mean we understand everything that is going on because of our superior knowledge of what we know, but that we do the right thing as life comes along. Some drivers may have a lot of knowledge about everything, but they can't drive well at all. Others who have less knowledge consistently do the right thing as they wisely drive through life. So let's look at what James has to say, those verses that we looked at last week. Let's see what it says about wisdom and the characteristics of heavenly wisdom. So let's start with verse 13. He says, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. Like, like what I was saying before, we don't hear much about that very often, about wisdom. Back then in the, in the biblical times, they really sought out wisdom. Remember in 1 Kings, God said to King Solomon, you can have anything in the world, just ask me. Instead of uh, asking for riches or smarts, King Solomon, he asked for wisdom. God gave him the wisdom to ask for the right thing, and God was said, great choice. It's a good thing to ask ourselves. It is something that we should uh, seek after. But if not, why not? This, again, isn't about head knowledge. He explains wisdom is an applied knowledge. It's an action. He doesn't just have to do, doesn't have anything to do with intellect. It says, by his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. He explains wisdom has to do with your behavior. James is talking about action. Is about your conduct. Is about what you actually do. And to do it in meekness, gentleness of wisdom. It's much more than education. He says is about your conduct. If, you're, if you think you're wise, then we should see it in the things that you do. And by your general behavior. And it's also by your weak meekness. We live in a day when everyone wants to give advice. They want to tweet. It shows up their wisdom. But the Bible says if a person has wisdom, there is a meekness about them. It's not an arrogance, but a gentleness. Meekness, of course, is not weakness. Israel's powerful ruler Moses was himself very meek, more than all men that were on the face of the earth. And in addition, Jesus said of himself, I am gentle or meek and humble in heart. Meekness does not mean cowardice or any of his similar characteristics like spinelessness, timidity, or peace at any cost kind of attitude. Neither does meekness suggest indecisiveness or wishy-washiness, a lack of confidence, shyness, or some withdrawn personality. It's not something that's a wimpy niceness. That's not meekness. Seeing what meekness is not, the other possible meaning of meek and gentle are, you know, what we usually use it for. In classical Greek, the word um, was used to describe tame animals, soothing medicines, a mild word, or a gentle breeze. James gives a litmus test for anyone who thinks they are wise. The test being not prideful, but gentleness, meekness, and mildness in dealing with others. The wise know that God is in control. And then they also know that they are unworthy sinners, but yet loved by God. So they can confidently meet any of their problems and any of their critics with the gentle assurance that God is on their side. The wise know how to do the right thing as they pass through the traffic of life. So after having established James, the general shape of true wisdom, James goes on to describe the two kinds of wisdom. He says in verse 14, but do you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart? Do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes from above, but is earthy, unspiritual, demonic. So he explains there are two different types of wisdom. There is an earthly wisdom and another one that comes from above. He says the way you can tell is that a person who has an earthy wisdom is a person who is filled with jealousy and selfish ambition. Think about those words, jealousy and selfish ambition. Wishing what others have or wanting to make a name for yourself. 
James continues in verses 16 to 18. For where jealousy and ambition exist, there will be discord and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good, gift, good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. You see, wisdom, again, isn't about education and intellect. Wisdom is about action. It's about character. He says, if you have wisdom from above, then that person is pure. This purity comes from when one has been cleansed by Christ's blood, has received Christ's purity, and as a result, is himself pure and leads a morally pure life. Now, I don't mean that he's perfect. It's similar to what it says in 1 Peter 1.15. Be holy in your conduct as God is holy. Also, this person's heart is pure in, in, in what we, I would say, an unmixed devotion to God, like single-mindedness to be devoted to God. James repeats this idea in verse, um, chapter four, 4, verse 8. Purify your heart, you double-minded. He is saying, get rid of your mixed motives, your double-mindedness. Be committed and pure in your devotion. This carries the idea of being pure in only one's focus on God, concentrating on serving him only. And then there's peaceable. He is not quick to start arguments. This is more than just walking away or avoiding the other um, to avoid a fight. But rather, James is commending the peaceful spirit. The hearts of those with such peace have met Christ, who himself is their peace. They have the peace he gives, which is totally unlike the peace the world gives. The person walking in heavenly wisdom longs for peace. They make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace and make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. And then there's gentleness. The wisdom from above also makes one gentle or in other translations, considerate. It describes a person who, though wrong, does not violently lash back nor tear down his accuser. The man with this quality makes allowances for the weaknesses and ignorance of others and takes the kindness perspective whenever possible. Next one is open to reason or other translation, again, submissive. Are we labeled unreasonable or do we listen to everything? Do you evaluate everything? Are you willing to submit to persuasion or open to reason? A teachable, open heart is often a major key in diffusing conflict. The wise are open to reason. They are submissive to other ideas. Mercy. Next to mercy, I mean the wise, are characterized by full of mercy and good fruit. The idea is a wise person see the needs of others and see to show mercy on them and see to care for their needs and good fruit. And again, what comes out of a person's life? Sometimes we follow people because they have a PhD behind their name or they have a doctor in front of their name. No, James says, it's about looking at their lifestyle, look at the fruit of their life. Next one is impartial. The sixth characteristic of true wisdom is that it's impartial. You're wise enough not to show partiality, like we talked about early in James, how you don't look at, you don't favor the rich or making them more important than those who are starving. There's no partiality in those who have heavenly wisdom. Next one, sincere. Finally, wisdom from above is sincere, or literally without hypocrisy. Those who have heavenly wisdom never play at. What you see is what you get. Here are my faults. Having given the seven characteristics of heavenly wisdom, James now ends the sections on wisdom with a popular proverb from that time. It goes, peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. The sense is, righteousness cannot be produced in a climate of bitterness and selfish ambition, but rather is fostered by wisdom from above. Righteousness can only grow in a climate of peace, which only those with true wisdom possess. As James describes this true wisdom, as we evaluate our lives, can we honestly say we are full of wisdom? And it's something that we aspire to. 
Like Proverbs says, Proverbs says, seek it more than riches. And remember early in chapter one, if any one of you lack wisdom, he should ask God and it will be given to him. Or maybe it's something we are pursuing. Or maybe it's something that we're not. Maybe we're pursuing success, money, or knowledge. But scripture is saying wisdom is what we should value the most. It is God's wisdom that we need to get navigate this life here on earth. Let me end the talk by answering this one question. How does wisdom from God come to us? How does it come to us? The scripture identifies four specific avenues. The first one is reverence. The first is reverence or respectful fear of God. Scripture says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, Proverbs 9, 10. When we see God for who he is, holy, awesome, loving, and sovereign, and embrace a proper fear of him, we're at the doorway of wisdom. And we step through the door when we acknowledge our own finiteness and inability to direct our lives. There can be no wisdom apart from a fearful vision of God and our own contrasting littleness. When we truly see God and truly see ourselves, we become humble and meek, and therefore teachable and receptive to God's wisdom. As Proverbs 11.2 says, with humility comes wisdom. We could be the smartest guy on earth, and yet without wisdom, but in a hum, I said that wrong. We could be the smartest guy on earth, and yet be without wisdom. But in a humble relationship with God, we can have wisdom. Next one is conversion. When we become Christians, we could become what the scripture describes as in Christ. A term Paul uses over 161 times in his letters. It emphasizes the dynamic relationship we have with God through Christ. In respect to wisdom, believers are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That's in 1 Corinthians 1.30. Since all God's wisdom resides in Christ, when we came to be in him, we become rooted in wisdom. Our relationship with Christ assures a transfer of this wisdom to us and opens us further to more wisdom. The third one, scripture. In Psalm 119, it talks about the wisdom that comes from God's word. In verses 97 to 100, it highlights the truth that wisdom comes from knowing God's word. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are with for they are ever with me. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. None of us will grow in wisdom that God wants us to have without spending long hours reading and meditating on God's word. Do we spend as much time with the Bible as we do, say, online news or Facebook? The next one's prayer. The last avenue to wisdom is prayer. As we saw early in James verses one, chapter one, verse five, it says, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. So anyone who asks believing will get wisdom. God will always keep his word. There is wisdom for the many decisions that have to be made in, in our lives. We just simply need to ask for it. So the formula for wisdom is this. Number one, reverence or fear. For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Number two, conversion. Receiving Christ who is wisdom from God. Number three, the scriptures, which convey the wisdom of God. And number four, prayer, which brings the wisdom for the asking. So as we follow this formula, we will know how to conduct our lives with ultimate wisdom. That's it. Let's pray. Dear Father, we pray that you will make us pure in our moral lives and in the purity of our devotion to you. We pray that you will fill us with heaven's wisdom, making us peace-loving. Help us to promote peace with those around us. God, we pray that you make us considerate and reasonable so that we can relate to all kinds of people. Make us submissive and open to reason so that when we are wrong, we are open to changing our minds. 
And Lord, may our wisdom be characterized by mercy and good fruit, showing compassion and being the hand of Jesus to persons in need. And finally, give us the wisdom to be impartial and sincere. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.